This Is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. It's flu season. Did you know influenza can impact marine mammals? Coming up, we learn about a project studying influenza among gray seals. So far, research has shown gray seals that have the virus don't necessarily die, unlike harbor seals, which have been found dead along New England's coast in recent years. Scientists want to know why. We'll talk with a researcher later in the show, part of a team that includes Mystic Aquarium. But first, Long Island Sound is an asset to Connecticut and New York. The estuary was once very unhealthy. Citizens and nonprofit organizations helped turn the tide, so to speak. One of the groups responsible is Soundkeeper Inc. A Connecticut native is the new Soundkeeper of Long Island Sound. Bill Lucy is from Wilton, and he recently moved back to the state to take the job. He joins us in studio. Bill Lucy, welcome to where we live. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. I understand that you are the new Long Island Sound Keeper. Tell us about this position. What do you do? Um, well, primarily I go out in a boat and do patrols on Long Island Sound. And how long has this Sound Keeper position been around in this region? Why is it important? Well, back in the 80s, mid-80s, there was some concern about the health of Long Island Sound, and and particularly 1987, many people from the area know it was a a large crash in oxygen levels in Long Island Sound. Um, So over the next few years, different people mobilized, including Terry Backer, who uh, was a group with a group of commercial fishermen, um, decided to try and do something about it. And they used the Clean Water Act to go after municipalities that were dumping sewage into Long Island Sound, causing the crash of oxygen levels. When you mentioned the, the crash in oxygen levels, so they were runoff, what was going on? What was going into the water? So nitrogen is a primary driver of what we call hypoxia, when there's low oxygen below 3 milligrams per liter, or anoxia, which is zero oxygen. Um, what happens is it feeds the sewage or other sources, it comes from the atmosphere. I mean, nitrogen is very common. Um, It's the largest component of what we breathe. But when you have too much of it, just if you over fertilize your garden, say a tomato, you'll get all plant and no fruit. Well, what happened in Long Island Sound is you had these incredible algae blooms and great growths of seaweed. And they all use oxygen at night during a dark phase of photosynthesis. Plus, they die And as they decompose, the organisms that consume them use oxygen as well. So this was a dire situation. You mentioned your predecessor, Terry Backer, a commercial fisherman at the time, uh, working to uh, hold people accountable for what was being done to Long Island Sound. And that's where the Soundkeeper uh, organization grew out from? Yeah, I believe he was the second Soundkeeper. The first one was uh, the Hudson River Keeper. Um, and yeah, it was to basically give a voice to Long Island Sound, much like the Hudson River Keeper was giving a voice to the Hudson River. And now I believe there's 234 different keepers globally. Um, I think 30 to 35 countries are represented, anywhere from Iraq to Colombia to Russia. There's, there's keepers all over the place, um, because most of the waterways on the planet are compromised in one way or another. You mentioned the 234 keepers. These are nonprofits that are committed to uh, looking out for the the cleanliness of our water. Yeah, they're they're from single individuals to larger groups. I'm going uh, today, I'm heading to Maine to attend the Northeast Regional um, Waterkeeper Association or Waterkeeper Alliance meeting. So there'll be 25 waterkeepers and we'll get together and strategize for what the next moves are into the future. It's an interesting term, water keeper. I understand that it's based on an old English tradition. Yeah, there's a great book by, um, I believe his name was I mean, Dr. Montgomery, um, and called The King of Fish. And they, he looked at the old laws in Scotland and England about protecting salmon and banning dams and not blocking fish migration. Um, so that is a thousand year old tradition. So yes, water keepers um, have been around a long time as a concept. I understand that you're a fish and wildlife biologist, also a Connecticut native. So I should say welcome back to Connecticut. <laughs> Thank you. I understand your career has taken you around the globe. Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, you know how you got involved in this work. 
Well, I grew up in Wilton, and we fished Long Island Sound a lot for flounder and bluefish. Uh, we used to go up to Groton and take boats out of there and go fish off the shelf, uh, fished for trout in the streams, bass in the lakes. Um, so I went and pursued a degree in fisheries up at the University of Vermont, and that led me to a fisheries extension work in Guatemala and the Peace Corps. So I was a fisheries extensionist and sustainable agriculture extensionist for probably close to three years in Central America. Um, and after that, I went and worked for the federal government up in Alaska as a fish and wildlife biologist for the U.S. Forest Service. Did that for about seven years, and then um, there was a large initiative with the sustainable salmon funding, and we created a watershed council. So I went to work for the city and the local fishermen and did that for uh, 15 years or so, and then... Um, Decided to move on to go back to the tropics, I guess maybe because I, when I was in the Peace Corps, I missed the mangoes and the bananas. <laughs> um, so we moved to Hawaii, I went and worked for the University of Hawaii, and uh, was the manager for the Kauai Invasive Species Committee um, for the island of Kauai. And after a few years of that, I guess I decided I missed the fall and apples, and I have a lot of friends and family in the area. And, so after a 30-year walkabout, uh, I came back. And I guess one of the reasons I did that is because being in Alaska for so long, it's an incredibly pristine ecosystem. Um, there is no limit on the number of seals and sea lions, and the bird migrations are incredible, and the forage fish, the crabs, I mean, they all go through cycles. But it's a very intact place. So I had a I have a good sense of what a functioning ecosystem is supposed to look like. Um, and I started hearing about positive signs in Long Island Sound. Uh, the nitrogen cap was reached, so both New York State and uh, the state of Connecticut reduced their nitrogen by 58, 59 percent. Um, after 15 years of working on, I believe, 106 different sewage treatment plants, um, they made great strides. Whales have come back. Seals have come back. Um, yeah, so I, I said, wow, Long Island Sound's not dead because I left in 1987 from Connecticut and returned in 2017. So I, I, I left in a really bad year, and I never thought I, it, the, the place would recover. But it's not recovered yet, but uh, it's well on its way. Let's talk more about uh, the life that uh, we find in Long Island Sound. Uh, it's not dead, like like you said, but um, in terms of uh, the species that are in the water that um, are facing challenges. Yeah, well, the the famous one is obviously the lobster. Back in 1993, I believe, or 94, when I got out of the Peace Corps, so in 1994, I went and fished uh, lobster out of Port Jefferson one winter just as a deckhand helping out an old Peace Corps buddy, and we caught a lot of lobsters in a short period of time. Um, and then what I've been hearing since I came back is there's very few lobstermen left. Um, I have talked to researchers, and I believe it's 18 degrees Celsius is just tolerance level for lobsters. Um, there's also issues with ocean acidification. A lot of larval species, copepods, uh, baby lobsters, baby crabs, they have um, calcium in their, their exoskeletons when they're, they're macro um, organisms or plankton, um, zooplankton. And that can be dissolved by, by too much uh, acid in the water. Um, I'm not sure that's what's going on. There's theories of pesticides affecting the lobsters. There's a lot of um, ocean cycles that go through multi-decadal oscillations, they call it. There's cold and warm periods that favor different species. So I don't know what's going to happen with the lobster, but what I suspect is that the blue crabs, which are more tolerant to the warmer water, Chesapeake Bay is a classic example, that their population is going to move north and lobstermen are going to switch from catching lobsters in Long Island Sound to potentially catching blue crab for a living. I know you're new uh, to the job, but are you hearing from commercial fishermen, lobstermen? What are they telling you? Um, they want to know what I think happened. Um, and is there going to be any way to bring it back? Um, since there's a few people out there fishing, 
we are getting reports that the catches have gotten better, but whether that's a factor of uh, fewer fishermen going after a somewhat recovered um, or a growing population of lobster, I'm not sure. Um, other species that are having issues but showing signs of recovery are in Manhattan. So I'll be heading down to give testimony in Baltimore um, in a week where they're looking at changing the Manhattan or bunker um, management to include ecosystem uh, considerations, basically living, leaving fish in the water for the seals, for the striped bass, or the bluefish, um, and not just having it where fishermen can take the maximum sustained yield. So it'll be a portion for the fishermen, a portion for the ospreys and the wildlife and the predatory fish, mm -hmm. and then a proportion to keep the species going with uh, spawning bi biomass. Um, they have been recovering. There was a cap put on in 2012, and I've talked to a number of recreational fishermen mainly who's just been fairly amazed at the amount of bunker they've been seeing over the last few years in Long Island. And this Sound. is a type of fish? Yes. Bunker is a forage <laughs> fish. Yes, yes. It's a... <laughs> It's the base of the food chain, one might say. Just the other day, we were out, yesterday, in fact, we were out patrolling uh, up the Hutchinson River um, over by Orchard Beach and um, the Bronx, Westchester County area, and there was a huge school of striped bass feeding on what's called pea bunker, a little one to two inch bunker. And there were five or six kind of birds feeding on them. There was loons, the striped bass were jumping out of the water. Um, so all those animals were there feeding on Manhattan, which the locals call bunker. I was curious about the water quality, the dead zones that still exist in Long Island Sound. Is it worse on the western part of the Sound? Yes, it's, it's worse for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's where the Long Island Sound necks down and turns into what's called the East River, which is really just an estuary mm -hmm arm. It's not really a river. Um, so it's hard for the nutrients to flush out. So when they come in, they can settle out in that area. So we have high, high nutrients in there. Um, and the reason we have that is, is because of all the people. The density of, of people in the area is huge. So there's a lot of um, uh, sources of pollution from that high density population. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Bill Lucy is in studio with us today. He's the new soundkeeper of Long Island Sound, a role that includes regular patrols on the water, as well as advocating for marine life and the health of the sound. After the break, we'll hear more about Lucy's role and his views on conservation efforts on the local and national levels. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking to the newest soundkeeper of Long Island Sound. Bill Lucy is a Wilton, Connecticut native and a fish and wildlife biologist. Bill, walk us through a typical day as soundkeeper. Who and what are you encountering? So, well, uh, we have mitigation money. So this is yesterday. We went out. We fired up the boat. We took our green infrastructure team, which is part of our group, Save the Sound. Um, they do dam removals for fish, wetland construction, rain gardens in cities. And we have some mitigation money that uh, came from a lawsuit that Terry Backer won uh, several years ago with the city of New York. So we're looking, what can we do with this funding? So we took our green infrastructure team out in the boat, and we slowly cruised along the shoreline and looked for areas where maybe we could uh, fix erosion or clean up. I think we saw nine abandoned boats that were blown up on shore. So 
Um, in that situation, I would call the Coast Guard and notify them that we have a lot of boats here. Um, maybe we want to look for funding to help clean them up, do a beach cleanup, get some local groups involved. Um, if there's an area where maybe we can use dredge material from a local river and create a wetland off to the side to increase uh, wildlife habitat, that's one, one of the projects we looked at. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really no typical day. Uh, we might get a report from a citizen that says, hey, I smell a, a, a sewage smell over by this pipe. So we'll send out a, our, we have a lab where we can test for sewage and um, other uh, water quality parameters. So we'll go take a sample bottle, we'll incubate it in our incubator, and then we'll read the results. And if it's uh, a high level of bacteria that exceeds federal or state standards, we'll notify the town. And we'll say, hey, you've got a broken sewage pipe here. Um, you're in violation. Uh, I suggest you guys go take a look and fix it. And what I'm finding is about half the towns are responsive. And they'll go out and they'll get the crews out there and jackhammer through the sidewalk and find the problem and, and fix the pipe. And other towns aren't so responsive. And the ones that aren't, we email them several times. We give them a pollution report. Um, we call them, and then um, we utilize our legal team to put more pressure if that's what's needed to, to keep the sewage from flowing into the water. Now, you kept mentioning we. So the Soundkeeper, uh, you uh, work both in Connecticut and New York. Uh, it's a part of a merger between Connecticut Fund for the Environment and Save the Sound. Talk about the, the team that you're working with. Yeah, so we're about 25 people, and we have um, an office in New Haven, which is primarily Connecticut Fund for the Environment. I'm a program of Save the Sound, and we have our water quality team down in Mamaroneck, New York. So we have an office and a lab down there. Um, and we also have another boat, which is a water quality boat that is um, doing work primarily in, in western Long Island Sound because of the reasons you mentioned. That's where the, a lot of the problems are right now. Um, so the Soundkeeper was an independent organization of Terry Backers. And when he passed away, unfortunately, it went into limbo. Um, and all three groups, Save the Sound, Soundkeeper, and Connecticut Fund for the Environment, um, decided to pool their resources and become a bigger organization. Um, so that allows Soundkeeper to have access to, let's say, for example, the Connecticut Fund for the Environment's legal team. If we need a little more muscle to get people to do the right thing, we have that option. Um, if we need water quality results, data, we want to show up with data, we want to show up with reality, truth, evidence. We have a lab, so it's really expanded our ability to um, uh, clean up Long Island Sound. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Backer, who passed away in, in 2015. He was also a legislature within the General Assembly. Um, how do you see your role uh, as Soundkeeper um, in in working with legislators on issues that matter uh, to the health of the Sound? Well, we have a legislative um, strategy every year, and I've worked with both the Alaska State Legislature and in Hawaii, we had very good relationships, both with the local island governments and the state government as well. Um, very supportive. And what I found in Connecticut, both at the federal level and the state level is incredible support for the work we do. Um, both our senators, our representative, like Representative DeLauro, incredibly supportive, very effective people, very progressive, and they want to solve problems. Um, so what we'll do is prioritize what we um, think is a priority, and we'll make the rounds to Albany and, and to Hartford. Um, Terry was very effective and, and very well loved by his uh, fellow legislators is what I've been hearing. And he had some pretty big wins. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I doubt I will be running for office. <laughs> but um, he was very effective at, at what he did. And um, there's there some big shoes to fill. And I've only been here three months, so there's no way I'm going to catch up to him over the next next year. But I hope to to carry his torch um, so that if he's looking down on us now, he'd be very proud of what we're doing. 
I understand the boat that you use to patrol is named after Mr. Backer. Yes, it's been christened. It was christened by his sister, Cheryl. Um, it's the Terry Backer. And it's a 21-foot Mako. Um, it had an old engine. We just we fundraised, and we have a brand new uh, Evinrude E-Tech, which is a very environmentally sound engine on there. So that happened about two weeks ago after a GoFundMe campaign and and some very generous donations. So, yes, that's the Terry Backer is on the water again. And it, the thing about one of the reasons I wanted to apply for this job is because of some of the stuff that Terry Backer said. Um, one of the best quotes I heard him say, and as someone who grew up eating fish out of Long Island Sound and Connecticut's waters uh, on a very frequent basis, um, that the fact that some of our fish have toxic levels of mercury in them or that there are consumption advisories from Connecticut deep, that's theft. So Terry Backer basically said, you poison my fish so I or my children or my family can't eat it. You are taking that from me. That is theft. Mm. So going after the polluters, cleaning up the legacy pollution is, is a way of undoing that theft and returning that public trust, those fish, back to the people of Connecticut and New York, Long Island Sound. I understand you have a, a young son. Uh, uh, what do you envision uh, will be uh, the future for Long Island Sound for when he grows up? So um, compared to 1987, we're down to 70 square miles of hypoxia this summer, which is a steady improvement. Um, the nitrogen's gone. The nitrogen pollution's going down. We still have more to do. The technology to fix the sewage, the technology to uh, generate clean energy, um, the storm water technology to um, clean the water before it hits the sound. I think Long Island Sound's going to get cleaner and cleaner. And so hopefully when my son is my age, he's going to regularly see whales cruising through Long Island Sound. We're gonna, it's going to be common to see bald eagles, um, huge striped bass, um, seals swimming by. I, I, I think because Long Island Sound is such a productive, resilient system, if given the chance, that it will have the same uh, productivity as where I was in Alaska, which was a very remote place. That's my goal is to have clean water, clean seafood. Everyone can swim, no beach closures. You can eat anything out of the Sound in any quantity that you want. Um, and the wildlife are, are back in their former numbers. That's that's what I hope. You mentioned beach closures every summer. That's a, a common occurrence where we're getting notices from the state that certain beaches are closed. Yeah. So another part of our program uh, is this pollution or this bacteria monitoring, which I alluded to, this, this septic uh, or the sewage um, leaks. So there are different groups, like Harbor Watch is another group that does a lot of monitoring in Fairfield County. Our group's been focusing on uh, Little Neck Bay, Long Island, Westchester County, some of Fairfield County as well. And so we have monitoring stations where we're looking for bacteria. Um, so up and down these rivers, we're finding where the hot spots are. And once we find out where the hot spots are, we can go in and find out where the broken pipes are. And once those broken pipes are fixed, when it rains, it doesn't combine the sewage with the storm water, which means the beaches won't be getting this dirty water during rainfall. That's usually what closes the beaches um, is rain and it overflows sewage in certain areas. And then you get bacteria and they have to close the beaches. So that's kind of the goal, this long-term monitoring, is to find out and fix, find out where the problems are and fix all of them so the beaches stop getting closed down. This is where we live. We're talking with the new Long Island soundkeeper, Bill Lucy. Uh, you mentioned earlier green infrastructure. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of commitment from uh, the people who work at these nonprofits. Uh, but what can the average citizen be doing uh, to help you in your work? Well, um, wherever you live, um, it would be wise to have low flow showers, LED light bulbs, all the green infrastructure that you can purchase at the store right now. Um, 
Buy local food. If you have a yard, don't use chemical fertilizers on it. Keep all the leaves that fall from your trees. Each leaf, each tree has the amount of leaves that fall that cover its root system typically. So put those in a wire cage and compost them and use those to feed your lawn and feed your trees to keep that nitrogen from heading out in the sound. Um, and what we really would like people to do is if you see a problem, if you're concerned about beach closures, um, call us. Call, call Save the Sound. We have um, uh, um, different websites. You can call me directly, actually, at 203 203- um, 854-5330 if you see a broken sewer pipe or if someone's illegally dumping um, and stay involved, become a vigilant citizen and send in pollution reports to us because if we know where the problems are, then we can fix them. So that's having an active, engaged um, group of citizens uh, is how we solve the problem. We can't just wait for government to come along and fix everything for us while we sit back on the couch and complain about it. We have to actually participate ourselves. That brings me to my next question in terms of looking at political leadership, whether in Connecticut or down in D.C. Are you optimistic about uh, resources being spent for conservation and environmental cleanup? Right now, no, I'm not. Um, There's been a big raid on Connecticut's funds um, for say, weatherization. I think twelve or 13,000 houses could have been weatherized um, this winter, which saves fuel, saves money for the, the people in those houses. That's been, that's been raided. Uh, I understand that Connecticut's in a budget crisis, but that's part of management. You have to foresee these, these issues coming down the line economically and budget for them. What you don't want to compromise is the long-term investment. So if you invest in clean uh, long, a clean Long Island Sound, and you invest in an energy efficient, energy efficient towns and stormwater infrastructure. Those dividends will pay off for a hundred years. If you cut those now, you're just putting off those gains for a longer period of time. As far as the federal government's concerned, I have no idea. It's been very erratic. Um, we were concerned about not getting any funding for a Long Island Sound study, which has been going on since the crash in the 80s when people first got together to address the problem and, as I mentioned, made a huge uh, reduction in nitrogen pollution over the last 15 years because of that. Um, there was a threat that that funding was going to get zeroed out, and we actually did great. We doubled our funding this year, so it went from zero to eight million. Um, whether we get that again, we don't know. It's, so it's very difficult to do these long-term, proactive, progressive, solution-driven actions if you cannot count on on the government to be consistent. Once it makes a commitment to do something, and you know it's a 30-year commitment, you can't just stop it and start it at, at, on political whim. That's very damaging to this because... It's, uh, um, it's going to take us a long time. And, and as I said, we've made great progress in the last 15 years. It would be a shame to start going backwards. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, when your son is grown, you hope that Long Island Sound uh, continues uh, to be healthy, to see uh, certain species come back. Uh, there's more attention now than ever on climate change and uh, the warming temperatures and impact on our, our entire planet. Um, do you think that people should be optimistic? Is it should they feel like there's enough to do now that, that um, it's not too late? I think locally people can be optimistic. If you have, like in Connecticut, we have very progressive lawmakers. Um, and there's many anyway um, that are willing to deal with this and tackle this. Um, we need to do a managed retreat from areas that are going to be under submerged from sea level rise. Um, and as we retreat from those areas, we need to turn them back into green spaces. Um, we need to build up our, our marshes. Uh, we've lost a third of our marshes just in the last few decades because too much nitrogen is causing excess growth, which then they don't put enough into the roots and the erosion from the, the, the waves is knocking big chunks and as the sea level comes up. 
Um, we need to restore our oysters, and there's some good progress on that. So we have oyster reefs into marshlands and rebuild all of that stuff. So, and there's great groups like um, Green Wave is a project. There's commercial oystermen that are doing a phenomenal job of spreading oysters around the Long Island Sound. So the, the industry itself is helping rebuild or create some of this resiliency, the climate resiliency that people talk about. Um, overall, globally, will the industrialized nations decrease their CO2 fast enough to mitigate what's going to happen? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say I'm very confident that's going to happen, but I think thinking locally, I think Connecticut and New York can do their part to, regardless of what the rest of the world is doing, we should be putting our resources into to fixing these problems because the people who live in those states are the ones going to be affected here. So as government trustees, they should be working on it. And I think we are going to have some good successes locally. Soundkeeper, it sounds like a big job. What are your goals for the first year, Bill? Um, just to get to know Long Island Sound more intimately. Um, I was down in the Western Sound when I was a, a, a kid growing up. But I plan on patrolling. If you, if you put in every bay and harbor, every nook and cranny, it's about 600 miles. So I'm going to cruise by the entire shoreline going about five knots, looking for outlaws, um, stopping in towns and meeting people, um, talking to commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen especially because they are on the water all the time and finding out what observations they have, what problems do they see that need to be addressed. So the first year I'm going to be listening basically getting to know the ground, the water, taking my boat out all the time, and just meeting the people who use Long Island Sound, the sailors and the fishermen, and just listening. So, And from there, I'll, I'll come up with my own game plan based on what people want us to do. Uh, one last question. When you look at Long Island Sound, is, is there something about the history uh, that most people don't know about? What excites you about your job? Well, if you look back at the geologic history of Long Island Sound, it, it's amazing. And having come from Alaska, I, I, I saw brand new land appearing out from under the ice as everything was melting where I was. I was in a very glaciated part of northern southeast Alaska. So I could walk on ground where no one had walked on before. It was under a big 300 feet of ice. That's how it was here. So there was a big wall of ice going into the Atlantic Ocean, and as it pulled back, it left Long Island. And then there's this depression, and there was rivers running through that, glacial drainage rivers. And then it became a, a lake, and then that lake blew out, and the ocean rose, and it all filled in, and there you have Long Island Sound. So the geology is just stunning. And the productivity because of that geology, it's one of the most productive pieces of water in the world because it's shallow, large, and it can warm up. Um, and then you had humans living there for thousands of years on that shoreline, living off of the bounty. Um, so you can still see parts of it. Like I was on patrol the other day, even over by the Bronx, there's, there's the Park, Pelham Bay Park. Um, you can see the forest coming, the old, the deciduous New England forest coming down to the shoreline and uh, just stunning. It lets you realize what it could have looked like, what it did look like three, four hundred years ago before we built it all up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the history, uh, both human and geologic, is all interesting to me as far as Long Island Sound. Phil Lucy, a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. It was fun. Thank you. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Have you gotten your flu shot? The influenza virus can also impact marine mammals. After the break, we'll find out about a research project off New England's coast studying gray seals. Researchers at Mystic Aquarium are part of the team. We'll learn more coming up.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Flu season is upon us. It's a dreaded time of year filled with coughing, sneezing, and the copious amounts of hand sanitizer. But did you know that the virus is also a concern among some non-human species? marine mammals, to be exact. Here to tell us more is Dr. Wendy Purrier. She's a researcher at Tufts University. Dr. Purrier, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. So I understand we know that influenza affects humans, but it's also a virus that can impact marine mammals? Yes, it is. So it is primarily found in the natural reservoir of wild birds. So there's actually a lot more forms of influenza than we think about from year to year of those that infect humans. And we're starting to learn that a lot of those variants are probably infecting and circulating marine mammals as well. When we talk about marine mammals, specifically your research is dealing with seals? Uh, Yes, primarily. So we're interested in marine mammals kind of across the board, but the majority of the work that we do is based largely in seals that are prevalent in the Northeast region. So we do a lot of work with gray seals and then harbor seals and some harp seals that also come in through the stranding network to places like Mystic Aquarium and the National Marine Life Center. So if uh, we visit the Cape in the summer months, we may see these seals when we're at the beach. Exactly. The dominant seals that we see around New England would be the gray seals and the harbor seals. The bulk of our work is actually in gray seals uh, because as it turns out, one of the largest puffing colonies for great seals outside of Canada is actually right here in Cape Cod. So there's a large puffing colony off of an island off of Nantucket called Muskega Island, and then off of South Monomoy, which is below Chatham. When we're talking about influenza in marine mammals, uh, when they contract this virus, does it always result in death? So, no, that's actually something that is part of our research, and it's a developing story. So it had been believed until recently that influenza was a spillover into marine mammals. So it was circulating primarily in wild birds, and it circulates primarily in wild birds, but that every now and again, a form of the virus would spill over or trickle into a marine mammal, and there would be this large mortality event. And previously, that's only been seen in harbor seals, and it had primarily been in New England. Uh, The first reported case of one of these mortality events was in the late 70s. The most recent one that we've had here was in 2011, and then the most recent globally was in 2014, 2015 in the North Sea region. So that's what had been seen previously, that you get these mortality events in harbor seals. In 2013, we started to partner with a lot of organizations around the New England area to see if a virus is actually out there circulating in the animals outside of these events where we see animals you know, show up sick and dying. And as we found out, it is quite prevalent, at least in the gray seals. From 2013 on, each time we've gone out to look, which is usually during the pupping season each winter, we find anywhere from 5 to 20% of the animals have influenza. But as far as we can tell, they're not showing any clinical signs of disease from having this virus. You mentioned shorebirds, so when we're talking about the virus uh, being transmitted, is it through um, their fecal material that's left on the beach? I mean, I'm curious about the transmission. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question, and that's one of the things we're trying to get to. We we don't have the answer for that yet because it's, it's still pretty new information that seals regularly have influenza. The assumption is that it is likely coming from birds, and the follow-up assumption from that would be that it's probably from fecal material on the beach or environmental maintenance of the virus. So the virus can survive for quite some time in the water or in in soil. So perhaps being shed fecally from birds and then seals are coming into contact with it as they're, they're on the beach. But that's still, it's still not clear. It could also be a different form of influenza that's circulating just within the seal. It could be going back and forth between seals and shorebirds. Um, We we simply don't know yet. What about relationships when there are nor'easters or the fact that when when I think about when I go to the Cape and uh, with the, you see so many seals and with that come the sharks and with the presence of predators, does that impact uh, how often this virus can be transmitted among these seals? 
Yeah, so another one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how these other external factors may contribute to transmission of influenza, but also other infectious disease, but focusing on influenza, there are a lot of different things that will impact an animal's behavior. So when there are sharks present, the animals are more likely to all haul out onto the beach together, and that could potentially create a scenario where there are more seals in closer proximity to one another, perhaps making it easier for them to transmit virus amongst one another. There's also a phenomena that we've seen, though it's it's not well documented yet, but we're seeing evidence that when there are those nor'easter events that come through, there's a large wash-up of surf clams that happen. And when there are all these surf clams on the beach, there's a huge number of gulls that come down onto the beach to feed on the clams. And we end up seeing, when we look at influenza and the gulls, that there's actually a spike in prevalence of influenza in the bird population. So perhaps it's become because the animals are coming into closer proximity to each other as well. Perhaps there's a, a connection with the clams that has yet to be sorted out. And these are all things that we need to look at closer. Uh, we're talking about influenza among mammals, specifically marine mammals, with Dr. Wendy Purrier at Tufts University. Uh, you mentioned influenza virus uh, in gulls, and then also, um, I'm just curious, when people hear this, they don't have any reason to be concerned at this time in terms of transmission no, to humans. Yeah, absolutely not. That's not something that that we think is a, a strong concern. So when we're looking at influenza in these wild reservoirs, one of the reasons that we're looking is to understand how it impacts the health of the animal and to try to understand ocean health and the animal as a sentinel. But we're also trying to look at what forms of the virus may potentially be able to transmit to humans. So there is always the possibility that there might be forms that are circulating in the wild that could transmit to humans. And we want to understand which forms can and to try to better predict that. But with that said, there are over 144 different forms of influenza that we currently know of that circulate in the wild. And generally speaking, there are a very small number that circulate in humans. So H3N2, H1N1 are the primary forms that circulate seasonally in the human population. We also come into contact with animals on a regular basis that have influenza on a regular basis. So there is influenza in horses, in cats, in dogs, in pigs, in poultry. There's influenza that's being shed by gulls that are releasing fecal material on the beach, and we're not regularly getting influenza. In fact, we almost never documented that we get influenza from these species. So it's a very, very, very low chance that a human is going to end up sick from an influenza that's circulating in a seal. Um, I, I was curious if you could go a little further into the research you and your partners are doing in terms of when you're you know, trying to capture and uh, measure these young seals. Walk us through the research you're doing. Okay, so when we're looking at the active captures with the gray seals on the islands off of Cape Cod, it's a partnership with several different organizations. So we work uh, very closely with NOAA and the Northeast Fisheries and Science Center. And then we also work very closely with Mystic Aquarium, um, several other organizations around the area, including uh, the National Marine Life Center, IFA, Marine Mammals of Maine, um, University of Connecticut has researchers involved, Woods Hole. So there are a lot of different people who contribute to this work, uh, both expertise in the field with animal handling and with the research processing afterwards. Uh, And this is actually occurring in the middle of the winter on these islands off of Cape Cod. So it is it is almost always cold. It is often snowy. And we are going out on boats to these islands where we are focusing on pups that have recently weaned from the mom. So we're not going to interact at all with pups that are still dependent on their mothers because we don't want to interfere at all with, uh, with what's going on with the mother-pup interaction. And once the pups are weaned, then we're able to go and we can capture the pups, but it's done in a very short time frame. So we're handling them for anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. And during that time, the animals are sampled for uh, swab samples to look for influenza and the presence of other viruses. And we're able to 
collect blood to be able to look at a number of different parameters for their uh, how healthy their immune system is and whether or not they have antibodies against viruses, and that also helps to tell us whether or not they've been exposed to these viruses in the past. And we collect other samples like hair and whiskers, uh, fecal material, to look at a whole range of other things, including contaminant exposure in the animals. Environmental contamination will accumulate in the animal, and that can impact their immune system, which can impact how susceptible they are to disease. It also helps to give us information on the diet of the animal, the overall health of the animal, and all of these different different features feed into this overall analysis of trying to understand all of the different components that are impacting how susceptible an animal might be to something like influenza and how it might pass on within seals and to other animals. I understand the gray seal pupping season uh, begins next month, and you mentioned a little bit about the research, but how do you and your partners prepare for that? Lots and lots of preparation and lots and lots of time. So we end up having just piles and piles and piles of boatloads of material that we need to bring out to the islands. So just the the front-end support to be able to stay out on the island is a huge amount of effort and, and resources because we're staying off in these locations where there's no electricity, there's no running water, it's the middle of winter. So we end up actually camping out there uh, for anywhere from a few days to five or six days. And the Monomoy Refuge has actually been an incredible support and the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park, to support us being out on Monomoy. We end up staying in the innkeeper station on South Monomoy when we're in the fields there. And then Currently, we end up day tripping out to Muskegon Island. So there's a lot of of prep to bring out all the food and the water and fuel and our lab equipment and all the sampling supplies and all the emergency supplies and getting all the different protocols in place and making sure everybody's trained. Uh, So there's there's several months of preparation that goes in uh, ahead of the, the season before we even put boots on the ground. And this isn't the first year you're doing this. How many years now ha- have you been looking into influenza among uh, these gray seals? The first year was in 2013, which was a um, kind of an exploratory project because, like I said, we had only ever seen influenza in harbor seals when they showed up in these mortality events. So we weren't really sure that we were going to even find it in gray seals. 2013 was the first year that we went out with a a small sampling scheme on Muskegon Island, and we're actually pretty surprised that we found a high prevalence of influenza. So that began the study, which has has grown and expanded uh, since then, and has been every pupping season since so 2013 up through you know until current. Are there uh, any other similar uh, research projects going on in other parts of the world related to influenza among marine mammals, specifically the seal population? In terms of this sort of study, not that I'm aware of, traditionally it has been that when there's a mortality event, there are efforts put into place to try to understand what caused that mortality event. And in those instances, there's work done that surrounds the mortality event, and then that work comes to a close when that mortality event comes to a close. As far as ongoing surveillance to try to understand how influenza is circulating in the wild, Uh, This is really one of the the main studies that's being done that I'm aware of globally. Dr. Wendy Purrier is a researcher at Tufts University. Uh, We'll be interested in following up with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. This is a lot of fun. Senior producer Lydia Brown produced today's show. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Go to our website, wmpr.org slash where we live, for more about the show. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Thanks for listening.